Hello everyone. Um, good afternoon from, from Dublin. My name is Declan Carolyn and I am co-chair of ECR Community and it's my great privilege to welcome you to the second webinar from the ECR Capman Network series. I'm delighted that we've got a, a quite a large audience due to participate with us today. Over 500 people from 51 different countries have, have registered to attend the, the, the today's webinar. And I can see a lot of people logging in at the moment. And I think it's no surprise. I mean, we're dealing with a topic that has universal appeal. And we're looking at category management. We're dealing with omni-channel and e-commerce. And today we will hear from four leading global companies about how category management is being effectively employed within the omni-channel and e-commerce environments. We're going to hear about pioneering modern day category management. We'll hear about such things as digital captaincy, flywheels and quick commerce retailers. All are relevant, all are new, all are at the moment growing uh, and changing and very critical for us all to understand the cause and effect of each of these enablers in category management and operators. So we have a really good lineup today. Let me put it into a little bit of context in terms of the ECR Catman network. It's set up to be a forum to develop category management knowledge and expertise around the world. And our objectives of this global category management network are to share knowledge and experience, to track hot topics and technologies, to focus on interaction and collaboration, and to provide a forum for showcases, discussion, debate, and learning. And I promise you, all four of those objectives will be met in today's webinar. Our output so far has been within the steering group and webinars. We plan five steering group meetings this year and four webinars. And let me just give a couple of words on each because the steering group is very important. We're trying to bring together the best and brightest minds in category management throughout the world into one group, which will provide direction for our output within the Capman network. And you can see a very prominent list of retailers, suppliers, service providers, category management experts, and ECR representatives from across the world. Special welcome to our two newest recruits, Eva Maria from Aldi Nord and Philip Alonso Menez from GFK, who just recently joined the group. And you can see the amount of experience and depth of experience in this group is really impressive. And when we have a steering group meeting, the debate is fascinating. And we had a recent one to prepare for today's webinar two weeks ago. And we were covering so many topics within the world of category management. And one of our important outputs from this group is to maintain a relevant list of hot topics. And here to talk about the relevant the, the list of hot topics that we have to date, and perhaps just to give us a word on what to expect from today's webinar, delighted to be joined by my great friends, Luke, Brian, good morning, gents. Good morning, Declan and Brian. Hello, and everybody. Welcome. And I'm so glad to uh, be of some help with you, Declan, today on these important hot topics that we've been discussing. Uh, maybe two minutes to give you some perspective from, from our side. I think, Brian, you are a bit older than me, but uh, I think since the uh, 80s, we've never seen oh. such turmoil in the world. Never. And so much change that, that is happening. Um, the impact of COVID and, and the implications for category management were huge. It has really accelerated uh, the service that people are looking for at home, the convenience they are looking for, the importance of health, ecology, uh, and, and all of that has actually led to uh, you know, a distortion in logistics. And now is the war in Ukraine who has even strengthened that. That has led to amazing levels of inflation that force us all to you know, look at, into our costs, into optimizing our logistics. And this is absolutely necessary in a collaborative environment, not to negotiate more, but less and organize better to win in that very costly environment where we've come, where we need to help the consumer you know, manage prices in this world of inflation. 
and, and today we're talking up the omni channel because as i said never we've seen so much change in the world not only the consumer is changing not only the environment of economy of health has changed but also retail has changed and that has accelerated up the channel people switching from their phone to their tablet to their to the physical store and ordering uh, category management in that, in that uh, perspective has has become of a very high level of importance because category management is at the end of the day it's bringing the offer in front of the consumer and the client and the customer and so this is topic of today very very important but all of these things are being solved in our next webinar when we're thinking about technology and when we're thinking about technology it's not only what the consumer sees the apps you know the promotions that come via personalized offers it's also the technology in the store you know uh, how you can walk out the store without looking at the cashier uh, you know how you're followed on a camera eventually to see what it is that you buy or you know how the assortments are being done through very high level uh, of algorithms to map uh, or to organize the the algorithms more to the customized to the customs customer expectations and last but not least in our last uh, webinar we're going to talk organizational requirements organization requirements very important because you know when we're thinking about category management it can no longer be a question of sales only you know category vision is built together with the brand digital marketing sales trade marketing and then also how to work this outside how to work it with data and so i think we're all on for a, a magnificent series and uh, as you say declan we're over 500 people today and that proves that our hot topics are spot on brian what, what's your view my friend yes uh thanks luke uh yeah good morning good morning from los angeles everybody uh it's great to be to be part to be with you this morning um uh, and I, as declan said 500 people from 51 different countries that's pretty amazing i mean it's a great testimony to the to the global nature of category management so uh welcome all of you from wherever you uh, are and we we assume that our goal is to reach out to category management professionals around the world to continue to bring knowledge discussion education so as we continue to raise the bar and uh, allow you to contribute even more so to the success of, of your companies you know it's interesting here we are 35 years later 35 years ago if you can believe that i was only 15 at the time but 35 years later category management is still such a vibrant force in our industry around the world okay uh, and i think one of the reasons and if you look at these hot topics as we call them <clears throat> category management's ability to adapt over time has been quite remarkable actually you know we've been through ups and downs and sidewards and backwards etc but category management's ability to uh, to adapt to the environment, to the changes in the consumer, the changes in competition, the changes in technology. That's been one of its great strengths. And it's kind of interesting, we, our, our last session, we, uh, we grappled with this idea of inflation, which obviously, as we know, is a global phenomenon today for, for all businesses. And it was, it was interesting that, and the great message is that category management forces us to go back to basics. So when COVID came, when inflation came, when supply chain shortages uh, started to be an issue uh, for our companies, category management came to the rescue by forcing us to go back to the basics. You know, what is the centerpiece of success of our business? As things change around our business, focusing on the consumer and the shopper, understanding their needs, understanding to the depth that we possibly can, what their expectations are, how they behave, how they evaluate our performance, that becomes really, really critical. So category management, again, has prevailed and adapted because of its, I think, unique ability. Well, it's simplicity, one thing. Simplicity of principle, simplicity of philosophy. But really, more importantly, just its ability to, uh, in its methods, to be able to adapt and accommodate all these dramatic changes that have happened in the last 35 years. And there's no reason to think that this won't continue. And I think today's seminar is, is another great example. You know, we've, 
we're talking about one of the great uh, changing forces in our business world, uh, e-commerce, okay? And how does omni-channel factor into tools like category management? And, and you'll see, uh, the presentations this morning are fantastic. And you're going to see that category management absolutely accommodates this new change in shopping behavior. And I think, uh, you're in, as Luke said, I think you're in for a, a great session. Enjoy it, learn from it, and we'll come back and talk to you uh, later. Thanks, Brian and Luke. <clears throat> as you mentioned, our first webinar took place in April. We focused on the impact and implications of inflation, and we had superb presentations from David Chancho and Don Humby, Frank Bonamora and Philippe Supersac from uh, Lactalis Group, and Felipe Teixeira from Senso Sud in Brazil. And I'd encourage anyone to look at or to rewatch that webinar or download the presentations from the ECR community website. But let's focus on today's webinar. Let me introduce the presenters that we have uh, today. We're going to kick off with um, uh, Mark from GFK. Mark, good afternoon. You're very welcome to join us. Nice to meet you. Mark's going to give us an overview of uh, eGrocery, evaluation of the fastest growing channel in grocery. Then delighted to be joined by Stain from Amazon. And Stain is going to talk about how to raise the customer experience bar and how do brands partner in a smart way to accelerate their own flywheel. Good afternoon, Stain. Afternoon, Declan. How are you? I'm great, and thanks for joining us. We, we'll follow Stain's presentation by moving from a retailer to our manufacturers. Uh, welcome to Audrey. Um, good afternoon in Ireland, and good morning in the US to Tara. You're very welcome, ladies. Hi, great to be here. Hi, everyone. Second. And then concluding our presentations from the Red Bull office in Italy, we're going to welcome Alessia. And Francesco, along who have been joined this morning by Giulio, Giulio and Antonella from, from the office in Italy. Whereabouts in Italy are you from this morning, guys? Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. You're very welcome. Okay. Following all of our presentations, we'll have a panel discussion uh, and we, we, we will discuss some of the topics raised. But for all participants, please feel free to submit any questions that you have of our panelists and our presenters, and we will deal with them as time sees fit. But let's kick off today. We're going to start with, with a, a great presentation from Mark in GFK, and it's going to give us a really good overview in terms of all uh, the, the, the growth of, of e-commerce. Over to you, Mark. So hopefully you can see it already on my screen. Now I will turn it in presenter mode. Oh, sorry, I have to start on slide one, right? Can you see the slides? Maybe yes, someone can. Yes, right, Mark. Okay, perfect, thank you. So um, I would like to give a short overview about uh, the fastest growing channel within FMCG, which is e-grocery. I divided my presentation into three parts. So first of all, I would like to give a bit of an overview about the market, so the global development of the e-grocery channel. Then in the second part, I would like to talk about the different offerings. There is already a, a strong differentiation of the e-grocery channel, so there are different business models. And in the third part, I would like to talk about uh, different trends in e-com, uh, especially those who are upcoming. Let's start with a global overview about the e-grocery channel. As I said, e-grocery is the most dynamic channel within FMCG world and is growing much faster than the most important channels like hyper and supermarkets and discounters, and even three times higher than all of the other channels. So therefore, as we can see, e-grocery is a hot topic and still stays a hot topic. When we have a look from from 2019 to 2021, we see that e-grocery has increased its market share by 50% in just two years and now reached 7.2% uh, of market share within global FMCG. But of course, it's different from continent to continent. We see already uh, a share of more than 15% in Asia uh, and a high share in Western Europe with 6.9% in, in, in the US with 4.8%, but lower 
market shares in Eastern Europe with 8.2% and Lantam around 1%. Uh, which is also interesting is by now Asia is representing 45% of the overall e-grocery business, but of course there are still huge potential, especially in Lantam and Eastern Europe. If we have a look at the different uh, countries, uh, we see that um, yeah, uh, the, mo the, the highest value share we have in China mainland and in Korea South Korea with more than 20 or with around 27%, followed by Taiwan, um, the UK, France, Japan, uh, Netherlands, and Sweden and Denmark. So, as you see, the Asian and the Western European countries have the highest e grocery share by now. Uh, and you can have a look at your own country to see if you are following or have limited shares by now. What is quite interesting is that we see a shift in the dynamics of the value drivers. So in the first years of e-grocery, of course, the penetration was the main driver of, um, of growth. But we see in the last years, you see it on the left hand side uh, above, so that uh, the e-grocery penetration is slowing down a bit, the increase. So we have now nearly 40% um, of people who are doing at least once uh, a year e-grocery. But what we see is that uh, the e-grocery frequency per year is increasing and increasing. So people got more used to um, the offers uh, e-grocery and therefore and seem to like it. So therefore they increase the frequency, but still with only, let's say, 10 times a year, of course, there is still a lot potential for all of the e-grocers. On the right hand side you can see what I meant with the shift. So as I said penetration for was for a long time the main driver but especially in 2021 we see that there is a shift towards frequency. So it's important for the e-grocers to really um, get uh, their shoppers to a, a certain kind of loyalty um, then there is still space to grow. Then a last thing uh, about this overview, of course, what we see for especially for different business models, and I will talk to about these business models in a few minutes, that e-groceries, the e-grocery share is even higher in the, in the big cities uh, or the metropolitan areas. Um, here you can see on the lower side the index versus the country, and you see, for example, for, for Moscow, that the share in Moscow is already 12% for e-grocery, which is uh, two and more than two and a half times higher than uh, for other countries. And this is also true, for example, for Zagreb, it's uh, three times, or for Delhi, it's uh, three times more than the country has it. Of course, this is also due to offerings uh, you have in some areas and not maybe in rural areas. And this is why I want to have a closer look on the differentiation of the e-grocery channel. So my colleagues from Kanta uh, and we were doing this omni-channel report and we also had a look on how is e-grocery uh, emerging. And on the left hand side you see uh, e-grocery in the beginning was the marketplaces and then the typical websites where you can buy something. So the pure supermarkets and then it evolved. There were more direct to consumer in the uh, 2010th and then uh, the category specialist, especially in the pet care area on the frozen food area, etc., where we had this uh, category specialist. And now there are more and more business model upcoming uh, like omnichannel, pure supermarkets, quick commerce, aggregators, community group by live streaming. So we see a differentiation of the offering and this of course is also a channel for category management. I will come to that one later on. Uh, to give you a bit of an overview, I made just an example and this example is of e-grocery in Germany. Um, as I would mention, it's same, same but different. So there are differences. Um, these are only the main important players in Germany. There are much more players but smaller ones. So what we see is of course the the stationary retailers try also to offer some e-grocery. So on the left-hand side, we call them the omni-channel retailers or clicks and bricks. 
On the right hand side, there are pure players and we see totally different business models. So there are the pure supermarkets who have a full offering and want to have a big basket. The quick commerce players who are offering a quick service, uh, a quick delivery within 15 minutes or something like that. They have usually a smaller basket size. Then the aggregators who are collecting uh, products for you from different retailers and bring it to your homes. And we have the category specialists who have a very deep assortment uh, in one or several categories, for example, like Zoo Plus, who are uh, specialists in uh, the pet care area. So as we can see, there are different areas and uh, different uh, categories where they are operating. And in Germany, the nice thing is that we have at the moment 50% is clicks and bricks and 50% is already pure players. And when you have a look into the pure players, the most important channels are at the moment in Germany, the pure supermarkets with 20% and the category specialists with 22%. In Germany, we do not have that much of e-commerce, quick commerce by now. And also the, the aggregators are not that important in Germany. I know that it's totally different in other countries where especially the aggregators in Central Eastern Europe Europe, but also in Spain and Portugal are very prominent with um, Glovo and um, uh, Everly and quick commerce, of course, is also in, uh, especially in metropolitan areas is much bigger uh, with the main players. I think you all know, but we will come to that later on. And what I want to say is that we see that it's different offerings because we see that different target groups um, are using those, uh, those services. So omnichannel, of course, they try to service everyone with a full assortment. And therefore, we have yeah, nearly all of the target groups who uh, are interested in this offering. With the pure supermarkets, they are more um, targeting the single things and the families, especially the families. With the quick commerce, we see um, that uh, people are using it who are usually singles and things. With the aggregators, it's also about smaller households, so single dings and empty nesters. And the category specialists are totally different. They are usually elderly families, empty nesters, senior singles, who are really looking for special products in their specific categories, wine, um, uh, alcoholic drinks, uh, etc. So a totally different, totally different target groups we have to service. And also when it comes to the shopping mission, we see totally different shop shopping missions. As I said, click and collect, full basket size, pure players more in fresh and into food, quick commerce into food and sweets, um, uh, impulsive category categories, uh, the aggregators uh, are more into food and near food and beverages and the category specialists in Germany at least, they are servicing a, a lot food uh, and a lot pet care. So this is, as you can see, and it was just an example that we see that it, there is a differentiation uh, across or uh, within um, uh, e-grocery and of course for category management, there will be differences. In the third part, I will just give an overview about upcoming trends um, in e-grocery uh, uh, across the world. So. First of all, what we see is the blending of e-grocery business models. So Clicks and Bricks try to integrate also quick services into their omni-channel strategy, what we have seen in UK. Tesco is rolling out Woosh. Tesco is uh, joined forces with Gorillas. And uh, what we also see is that main deliver meal delivery players are entering the e-grocery market, two examples from Europe, Vault and Bolt. And on the right hand side, we see Amazon and hope you hear a bit more uh, from uh, from the Amazon colleague that uh, we see that, of course, there are first e-grocery marketplaces are opening up also from Rochlik. Um, so we see a bit of a platform technology also. The, the second trend is that we see also uh, collaboration or cooperation between e-grocers and traditional retailers. So quick commerce players cooperating with traditional retailers. Why do they do it? Of course, it's easier to, to source private labels with them. And sometimes they would love to use their sales hub or the shops also as micro hubs or as pickup points. So um, to, to increase uh, their reach. 
Uh, and then some of them are even investing in pure players, like Rewe was investing in Flink or Edeka was investing in Picnic. And sometimes we see that traditional retailers are struggling or trying to find the right way to start omni-channel offers. Here, the example of Aldi Nord and Süd. Uh, Aldi Nord partner, partnered with uh, or part, is partnering with Glovo to expand into Spain and Portugal. Uh, they are in Hungary. They are offering their own omni-channel um, offer, um, and uh, they started a partnership with Deliveroo, but they ended it um, shortly after. And the third trend, what we see is that we already see a consolidation in the e-grocery market. We all know that by now, um, not many of the e-grocers are profitable. And therefore, of course, they are all looking for efficiency and for yeah, getting a bigger base for their services. So uh, a lot of the big players are buying now smaller players like we have seen here. Now on this slide, and uh, just to let you know, it's always that you have to update your slides quite often when you do some e-grocery uh, research because it's changing so much. So I was, uh, this slide was from January, so I was talking about consolidation of the quick commerce market. But what we now see is that maybe it's a bit of imploding at the moment. So um, the market capitalization of DoorDash and Delivery Hero was was declining a lot and go path for example didn't or delayed their ipo because they thought that their their ambition the 40 billion um, euros market capitalization was out of reach and others like get here but also like gorillas were uh, are dismissing at the moment employees and cut down their expansion plans due to some um, venture capital problems let's say but nevertheless, there will be always new business models coming up. And here to, to show you some of the, the ones that are waiting in the wings. Uh, so full auto automated click and to elect like Ochama. So GD is doing in the Netherlands, uh, go and pick up. Or there is even a car um, driving around the, the Rewe snack mobile. Uh, it's the, it's uh, also a full automated click and collect, let's say. On the right hand side, we see that, of course, social and live stream commerce is getting bigger in a lot of categories. Also now uh, starting with e-grocery, for example, here, Walmart, but also DM and Lidl uh, are doing it in several countries. And it's quite popular, uh, of course, in China mainland. And this is also I want to share a slide with you because I think it's important for the discussion. So. As I said, it's all a bit different. And what we see here is that the Chinese households really try a lot the new upcoming services like social media, a community group by and live streaming. They have all a penetration more than 20% already. But what, which is even more interesting is that on average, the people in China mainland use at least three of or in, on average three of the of the business models so therefore we see that they they change from one to the other business model depending on their shopping mission so therefore um, of course it's important to adapt uh, things to the business models so as I said, I would say okay e grocery will be same same but different in the second half of the 20s. So by now we see that e-grocery is by far the fastest growing FMCG channel. And I would assume that 85, 90% would, would guess that it's also the fastest growing channel in the next few years. Um, there is a lot of differentiations we see in the business, business models with different offerings and different uh, shopping missions. And now coming to category management and hopefully it's a bridge to the discussions we have now and also to the to the upcoming presentations from the others so for category management it's of course important to reflect the special offerings and the spe special shopping mission missions the e-grocers have and um, you need to find specific category strategies and tactics to fit with the specific offerings and shopping missions of the e-grocer 
And as the market is frequent, uh, uh, fragmented and as specific category management concepts are needed, you as the supplier, as a manufacturer, have to choose and prioritize those business models which are the most important for your products and categories. So that was the short overview about the market, uh, and I'm happy to discuss it with you. Thank you so much, Mark. So we have the fastest growing channel in grocery in complete turmoil, dominated by companies growing, companies declining, companies in the, in the channel blending and cooperating with each other, but a channel that can't be ignored, one that's going to continue growing and one that we find new category management disciplines within. So we will ask you to come back for the panel discussion, Mark, but let's welcome a retailer on stage to talk about how to raise the customer experience bar on a daily basis and welcome Stain from Amazon. Hello, Stain. Hi, Declan. Hi again. How are you? Well, I'm great. Thanks, Thanks so for much for joining us today. And I love your first slide. No, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with the introduction you gave uh, in which, which a fascinating world we live today. And uh, yes, this this first slide uh, it shows a bit of the fascinating world of Amazon. Uh, this is a sign I see uh, I see about every day walking into the office or when we walk into our distribution centers. Uh, it's about work hard, have fun and uh, make history. Uh, and, and I would I would say that uh, given uh, each one's attendance here today, uh, everyone is ready to make history and uh, also understand how we can uh, how we can play a part and how we can write our uh, page in this history book. Um, if I uh, if I think about making history, uh, it often feels, of course, that we are jumping blindfolded into into the unknown. And uh, what I will try to do uh, and contribute to, uh, to this is to demystify a bit on uh, how can you jump into the unknown and how can you make history in an omnichannel uh, world. And let me maybe start with uh, starting with our mission as, uh, as Amazon. Uh, what, is, what is our mission? Our mission, as many of you will know, is to be Earth's most customer centric company. And we do want to have the whole selection where customers can find and they can discover everything they would like to buy. And if, if you bring it to a, to a quote which ignites the spark of innovation, I love this, uh, I love this specific quote from our, uh, from our founder, our friend, uh, our friend Jeff. And it's, uh, it's stating that customers are always beautifully and wonderfully dissatisfied. And they always want to have more, but they don't know exactly where the innovation needs to come from. And even if they say that they are happy with what they have today, they're always looking for better innovation. And that's our role as uh, Amazonian, uh, but I would extend it to the whole uh, Katman group. This is our role to continue to innovating on behalf of our customers and to continue delighting the customer's experience. So in that respect, uh, I would like to ask uh, each one of us three questions. And the first question I would want to ask is, do you know your flywheel? Do you know the flywheel of your business? Do you know the flywheel of your brand? And this is the Amazon flywheel. And the Amazon flywheel is, is core to everything we're doing. And let me, let me pause for a minute to take you through the flywheel as it's so critical into our entire business model. And we start from selection. So selection means we want to have the broadest catalog, the broadest assortment, the largest assortment possible. You will remember, of course, uh, the largest bookshelf of the world, hence the name Amazon. Once you have the largest selection, then you can think about how do we deliver the best customer experience before customers buy, during the purchase decision, and once customers have bought the product. So the end-to-end -end customer experience. And our job is, of course, to continuously deliver that best customer experience. And once you have the best customer experience, customers will come back, and more customers will come, and traffic will increase. And as the traffic increases, of course, more brands are interested to sell their products on your website, which 
as a consequence, will give you a larger selection, more brands, a larger catalog, which will keep on spinning the flywheel. And all of that will, of course, create scale. The more growth you can drive, the more economies of scale you can create, and the better value you can offer to your customers. So the three core principles to our flywheel are indeed that selection, that value proposition, and the convenience we give to our customers. And what is central, and for those who have worked with Amazon, you will definitely pick up on that idea. What is central to what we're doing on a daily basis is that constant daily iteration of fine tuning, tweaking, improving the flywheel. Because our core belief is if you improve every day 1%, by the end of the year, you have improved 37 times. And that constant improvement, iteration, fine tuning is core to our leadership principles. We do operate, first of all, always in a mindset of speed. We call it bias for action. But on top of that speed, we want to go for depth. And we call it dive deep. We want to make sure when we change something, that it immediately can create scale and can be there for as long as possible and for as wide scale across many countries, many business units as possible. Now, if you combine that bias for action, the speed, as well as with the depth, of course, needless to say, you can think very big and you can do a lot of impact or you can drive a lot of impact into a certain category, into a certain business. And these are three leadership principles, bias for action, dive deep, and think big, which are part of our 16 leadership principles, which are core to everything we are doing on a daily basis within Amazon. And I, I heard Brian referring earlier on about in raising the bar, insisting on the highest standards, and this is indeed core to what we do every day, both internally, as well as the way we work with our suppliers, as many of you here in the virtual room today. My first question was indeed, do you know your flywheel? Do you know the flywheel of your brands, your business, and how does it work together with a retailer like Amazon? My second question I want to ask is, do you master the formula of retail? Now, the formula of retail, I'll give you one version, but I already, I already saw in Mark's presentation earlier on, that everybody has a bit of a different, uh, different interpretation of what the formula of retail is. Ultimately, it leads down to the same. So retail sales, retail sales is an, is an outcome of penetration. How many customers, how many visitors that are coming to your store, that are coming to your website? How can you get them converted? It's your conversion rate, your closure rate. And then how much do they spend? What's their average order value? What's their basket size? Again, I'm not learning anything new here, which is your penetration index, loyalty index, spending index. You multiply that times your margin, and you reduce your operating costs, and you come to your net profit. Now, let me give now a couple of examples, uh, and I could give, a, a, give them 10 times more examples. Let me give you a couple of examples on how you can as a supplier, as a brand, can partner with Amazon on each one of these elements of the retail formula. Let me think first about attracting more customers, attracting more visitors, tapping into new audiences, or understanding your customer personas. Two programs which are very core to what we're doing on a daily basis is, first of all, the prime students. It will not be no surprise to you that students getting, when they're 18, 20, 22 years old, having to start deciding on their own expenses, start to become an important customers to tap into Amazon. And we have a very design, very dedicated program that is targeted and tailored to the student population with our prime student membership. Or another interesting, consumer group or consumer audience are the families. 
which we track with our parent experience group, where we target and we, and we accompany these families throughout the life stages of infancy all the way down to four, five, teenager years, and so on. So how do you partner together with, uh, with us at Amazon to tap into your audiences to understand when you have joined opportunities to reach your audience is an opportunity to increase your customer base. You can also take it from a more brand lens, from a more advertising lens, and work with campaigns or brand campaigns, like an example here uh, from our friends of Samsung. Or, as I have, of course, many category managers in the room here, you will know very well your cross-category purchases. So we do, and for instance, I do partner very closely with brands to deep dive with them what is the audience they tap into today in a category like sports, but what are the cross purchases with a category like sports nutrition, medical devices, massage appliances, and how can we cross drive cross purchasing between these categories in a database way and, and in a continuous way beyond just the one hour activity that we can continue building this loyalty in these audiences. So a couple of examples on how you can tap into with Amazon into having more customers, more visitors. If I move into conversion, again, a few examples, and one of them is Gift Finder. Now, Gift Finder is a uh, very simplistic way of translating your purchase decision tree into an online world. So we do ask the typical three questions in your purchase decision tree. We ask the customer in a very simple way to answer one, two, three, which ultimately leads to the customer get, getting a recommended choice for, in this case, their preferred whiskey. Very successful program, which we see rolled out across many brands at different locations of the year. We know for finding your gifts through peak periods like Christmas sales, or when you need to find the new school uniform for getting back to school. Another example and addressing a key barrier for an online environment is, can we please try the product before we buy? So we recently launched in a couple of parts of our business, but in, in specifically in our apparel business, for Prime members, try before you buy, which the concept says it for itself, you try the product, and when you don't, when it doesn't fit, when you don't like it, you just don't have to buy it. So there's not even any purchase involved. Another example of how we remove purchase barriers is 360 product degree images. Again, needless to say which barrier that removes, but in products which have a high ASP, we are building this immersive experience through either 36 degree images or even virtual showrooming for customers to be able to feel and to uh, navigate or to see their product in real life, uh, how they would have it normally in a physical environment. Again, I could have given thousand more examples on how do we drive conversion. Moving into basket size, one program is our Amazon basket. And again, the concept says it for itself. So how do you help customers when they move from a physical environment where they tend to go to a supermarket and yet they do buy their weekly shopping basket, how do you translate that into a grocery environment online? And again, uh, I think our friend Mark has given a couple of uh, indications at how important this is to have the right programmatic answer in an online environment for grocery shopping. And our answer or part of our answer to that is Amazon basket where you give an additional incentive to customers to buy more products which they would normally buy in a physical store environment. If we would move, and another example to the right of this slide would be what we call installments. Again, this is uh, something you see, of course, uh, largely, uh, largely uh, uh, available uh, across multiple websites. It's where you defer your payments and you split the payments uh, interest-free across multiple uh, months which is very important for what we call our high ASP part of the business to ensure and to incentivize customers to also buy into the premium selection of our, of our category. And talking about premium, of course, uh, uh, one of our uh, premium brands we're having uh, at Amazon is, uh, of course, Apple. Uh, 
And uh, what we do very successfully with Apple is not only, of course, being able to explain or to support the customer in the purchase of their iPhone, but also, as you will see in the bottom right of this slide, we do help to, 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 we do help to purchase the customer also the accessories. Accessories as a charging cable, the accessories as any other uh, adapter they would need that would fit together with their iPhone. Again, helping a customer in an online environment to build their basket size, similar to what they would do in a physical environment. Let me move further down the, the formula to margin. And, and of course, margin uh, tends always to be the, the, the tricky topic, but it should not be. If you see on how you can improve margin for a retailer, there's, there's multiple ways to do it. And again, two elements I, ha I added here on how we can build margin and profitability for a retailer. It's, for instance, the deals. So in a, pro in a, in a promotional environment, depending on, the, depending on the country, depending on the category, giving a good offer and on the right products and on the right profitable segment of your business can help not only to build the retail profitability or Amazon's profitability, we can help also to build your profitability and your profitability mix as, an, uh, as a brand, as a supplier. Another uh, program there that is, uh, and it's our number one loyalty program in Amazon worldwide, is sub Subscribe and Save. So how can you invest in a program like Subscribe and Save, where you will not only help the profitability of Amazon, you will also help building the loyalty of the customers uh, and helping the loyalty of your own customers into your own products uh, and that definitely the ones that have the biggest lifetime value where it just makes more sense for you as, as a brand. So again, very different adoption across brands and uh, I can only give the ones who are not really tapping into that uh, a slight nudge or, or, or strong nudge if I may to adapt into this, uh, this program as it's our number one loyalty and very successful uh, program. And last but not least uh, is uh, how can you remove operational costs? And again, there, there, there's many operating costs uh, that can be reduced. Maybe two examples. So yes, uh, in an online environment, uh, we do not only have a legal obligation, but we also do want to make sure that customers can return products if they need to. Now, needless to say that returns are the biggest cost component in an online environment. So the more we can reduce these returns, the better, of course, the operating costs work for Amazon. And another one is an inbound, efficient receipt, we do call it. So the least, the less defects we have when we take products into Amazon, the better, of course, it is for our joint operating costs. Here's my recommendation, please do work with Amazon, not only on one of these five components, but work across the whole chain. And you will know, and, and, and you've already heard it from Mark, uh, and you will know it from your own experiences, that of course, this formula is very different depending on the brand in which you operate. Uh, some components will be much more important than others. Or of course, outside of Amazon, different levers will be pulled and will be more important than if you would come to Amazon. So the more you can tailor this formula, the stronger you will be in the way we work together uh, between yourself as a brand as well as uh, Amazon. And this brings me to my last question. Uh, are you omnichannel? And of course, um, many of you will say, yes, we are omnichannel. And then the question is, are we truly omnichannel? And omnichannel should these days be the start from where everything leaves. And, uh, uh, be, being based in London, this of course would be your underground network, but everything ultimately starts from an only channel and every channel, sales channel, media channel is an outcome of that. And yes, I have my Amazon hat on here, but I can also from my pre-Amazon hat at both uh, PNG and L'Oreal, I can uh, see that it's not an easy uh, job to be 100% only channel. Because it requires to think across Joint business planning, revenue growth management, category management, business planning, data, etc. It requires every single part of the organization, every single function to think and to reflect upon how can we become E revenue growth management? How can we become E Katman? How can we become E business planning? And that requires a lot of changes in terms of mental models in terms of business planning models, internal processes and mechanisms, 
So it is not easy to coordinate that across the total business. And that's why it's so exciting, if you ask me, to be part of a category management organization, because you can be central to that. You can be agnostic to the specificities of a certain retailer or the specificities of a certain brand, but you can be the pivotal partner to lead all of this transformation within a company. So let me finish with uh, three takeaways that I, uh, I hope to, uh, to leave you with. It's please do know and do accelerate your flywheel. Maximize all the different levers of the retail formula uh, with Amazon, of course. And then last but not least, uh, Omnichannel is uh, everyone. Uh, Omnichannel is everyone's uh, job. So it, uh, it's my, uh, my suggestion, uh, please uh, make the jump. Uh, yes, the, the, it might feel a bit fresh water and you might feel lonely at certain points in time, but it's so refreshing to make the jump to Omnichannel. If you want to uh, continue the conversation, you can always find me here. Uh, and uh, please do, uh, do make history. Thank you all. Make history, Stain. Uh, I, I love it. Um, and thanks for making that link between category management and all the different functions within an organization and putting the letter E in front of it. Um, and some really solid advice for for um, brands, uh, are you, uh, how do brands partner with a need retailer and are you omni-channel? So any questions for Stain, please bring them in and, and uh, put them through and Stain will join us in the panel discussion. But it's a nice intro in, move, in building on those discussions about omni-channel uh, and how do you partner. And let's look at how to accelerate omni-channel leadership capabilities. I'm delighted to welcome our first manufacturer and supplier presenting today and from Mars Pet Care we have Audrey and Tara. Good afternoon ladies. Thank you Declan. Yeah, great, to, great to be here. Um, yeah super I think you said Tara we can see the presentation right? Yes. Great. So yeah, delighted to be part of today's um, lineup and talking about category leadership, um, omni-channel and e-commerce. So Tara and I are gonna spend um, the next uh, 15 minutes or so with you. Um, and we're going to just talk about three objectives. Um, so I'm going to bring to life a little bit about category management in an omni world, building on what Mark and Stain have already um, shared. Uh, we're going to bring to life um, our view in terms of digital captaincies and what it takes to really be the preferred partner of choice um, with um, our uh, digital customers. And we're going to bring to life some of the, the key learnings. Great. So for a bit of context, we've already actually talked about this quite a, a bit um, on the webinar so far. Um, but my background, actually, I've spent um, 20 years out in FMCG and I've had the, the privilege um, and delight to have spent the majority of that time in category management. Um, and as Brian and Mark and, and Stain have already said, what I particularly love about category management is um, how it continues to evolve and grow um, the broader retail environment and category management also specifically. Um, and we as category managers need to keep evolving to add value, be that preferred partner of choice for our customers and grow our categories by focusing um, on the shopper. And that's really what gets me out of bed in the morning is really about how do we better delight the, our pet parents, our pet shoppers, um, how do we make it easier for them to buy, how do we make it more visible, um, how do we make it a better experience. Um, so really that is uh, through building our category leadership capabilities um, and really deepening our insights and our data to ensure that we can continue to deliver against that. Um, and we've seen that evolution of category management over the last number of decades. So um, in terms of when category management started off as a discipline, you know, to stand out from the crowd, um, it was enough to really you know, be expert at data, really understand the category role. ECR gave us a fantastic framework in terms of the principles, the eight step process to be able to really um, deliver a category thought leadership and grow our categories. Um, and then we evolved that and continue to deepen those insights um, and continue to leverage those principles um, and the eight step process, looking at omni category management over the last decade or so, 
uh, looking at shopper journeys, shopper missions, uh, category visions have become you know, a rule of the game. Um, and now we're into that really integrated uh, shopper management. Um, and uh, as, uh, as Stane was saying, you know, how do we continue to really understand that formula of retail? How do we really start um, omni-channel first? And that really putting the shopper at the heart of what we do having a seamless shopper experience and um, so we can continue to, to grow our wonderful categories. So yes, there is absolutely no doubt uh, that category management is facing significant disruption. We as shoppers are, our retailers, manufacturers, but the foundational goal of category management hasn't changed. We still need profitable growth. And how we're going to do that is by continuing to really focus on the shopper and what shopper behavior change we want to drive to really deliver that profitable sales growth. And I think the four basic principles that have always been at the heart of category management continue to hold true, um, and even more so in today's omni-channel environment. So it starts with the shopper. It's all about a cooperative approach um, and how we really partner together. Uh, its basis is in data and facts and great insights, and it's a structured and permanent process and not a one-off. And I think those four principles, um, I think is even more important in this omni-channel world um, as the disruption continues all around us. Um, that really helps us to come back and anchor to uh, the principles of category management. And again, the, you know, the eight-step process can give us that filter in terms of um, really bringing together all of our insights and funneling it down into the so what and what are we going to do differently. So. In terms of where we start in Mars, so our global category vision continues to be our starting point. Um, and some of the teams have asked, you know, do we need a, um, a, a digital specific category vision or do we need a channel um, specific category vision? So our view is no, we need one global category vision that brings together all of our insights. Um, and then that, that forms the basis of our category vision framework. So that's our simple um, insight-led articulation of where shoppers are going to spend more in the category um, and how to grow. Um, and we use that as the basis as our enterprise foundation for growth uh, across our one demand and supply teams. Um, and that really drives our category strategies, um, our in-depth understanding in terms of the current diagnosis of our category trends to really identify the opportunities and sources of growth that will lead us to our category growth solutions um, and then into our, our picture of success. So grounded in our category vision, we orchestrate um, our shopper behavior change across all our channels. So obviously we started uh, from an in-store execution um, perspective, um, and you know, that is where we have a lot of our expertise. Um, we build out our, um, our key beliefs based on uh, a really robust research program uh, that we run across all of the markets. We bring together all of the learnings into our global key, key beliefs um, and codify those then into our perfect store program. And we're continuing to evolve that and make sure that that continues to stay um, ahead of the times. You know, how do we continue to make sure that those in-store environments um, remain uh, great places for um, our shoppers, that they continue to bring shoppers into the category, convert them, that we're looking at how we maximize our baskets. Um, over the last probably 10 years or so, we've really uh, focused on accelerating our digital capability. Um, so our in pet care, 22% uh, of our sales globally uh, sits online. Um, so it's yeah very important for us that we continue to build that expertise, which we have done. So we've really focused on our, our digital execution, again, based and grounded in our data and our shopper insights. Um, we have built our global digital key beliefs um, that really drive that our perfect digital store um, and um, into our, our uh, driving our overall category growth. Um, and the opportunity is to continue to develop those, but really starting, as Dane said, from an omni approach. So we want to make sure that we continue to integrate our learnings and um, that we go deeper on our insights, that we really take a shopper perspective. Um, and Tara's going to talk to you a little bit more about how we're doing that. And Brian said at the beginning that you know category management uh, continues to survive and uh, evolve and expand and continues to be as relevant as ever. And I completely agree with that. So I think you know for me, category management is a combination of a philosophy. So it's your category first approach. 
it's about having the right organization and talent um, in place to, to really drive that uh, from insights through to execution. Um, and it's about um, having the right processes in place. And we still um, use the, the eight step process as our grounding um, and make sure that we um, use that as a, a way to really filter through um, from our uh, starting with our, our strategic alignment through then to our category review. Um, and we have seen this uh, eight step process expand over the, you know, over the last number of years. Um, and it is just as relevant for digital um, category leadership as it is for um, offline category leadership. And the key, I would say, and where we're seeing um, some great um, results and uh, really building that expertise across all of the teams is when we can integrate um, offline, online, and really have an integrated approach. So just to highlight some of the, you know, some of the differences that I see from a strategic alignment uh, or eight-step process perspective. So from a strategic alignment, um, you know, assessing our ability to partner, um, will skill is a new, but making sure that we're doing that also from a digital and omni perspective, um, and really identifying, you know, where are the um, areas of alignment and where might there be um, conflicts um, that we're, you know, clear on those upfront and we're able to, to really partner then in the right way. Um, it's important that we review our category definitions and our category segmentations and we're clear on those uh, from an omni perspective um, and how from a digital perspective they are similar or different to the in-store environment. So making sure that we're doing that, um, doing that check and really building that understanding um, is key. I think category role is so important. I think sometimes we get down into the, the tactics and the implementation and actually realize that maybe we haven't got that alignment um, in terms of the role our category plays right up front. So really thinking about what role it currently plays and what role could it play in the future is critical and bringing in some of our digital metrics such as traffic and conversion um, and thinking about, you know, is your category a destination category um, online? Is it a core category uh, with the potential to be a destination or a hero category? Um, and are we aligned on that um, from a, a, a shopper and a, a retailer and a manufacturer perspective? Um, I think category assessment then is absolutely um, critical. So making sure that we really build our recommendations grounded in our data and our insights and using our digital and omni insights. And as I work um, so in my global role um, as a part of the global category leadership team, I think you know, we can really deliver fantastic category assessments, um, whether we have um, you know, in-depth data availability or whether you know we have more foundational data availability. So um, we kind of look at our assessments based on um, what data is available, how we can augment that through our digital store walks, through our best practice sharing across our other markets, through our benchmarking. Um, so making sure that we do that robust category assessment so that we can identify where are the category opportunities and how can we really unlock them through to our category scorecard and making sure again that we've our distinct digital and omni metrics within that. I would say from a foundation perspective, um, we need to be looking at obviously our sales and profit um, of our category and shopper satisfaction or out of stocks, um, our substitution rates. Um, from a more than advanced perspective, uh, looking at our industry benchmarking and considering that shopper behavior, our penetration, trips, spend per trip, um, market shares, um, and really then from a leadership perspective, being able to really um, deep dive into the clickstream data and the page views and your conversion rates and your um, search term volumes so that we can really um, make sure that we are identifying the right areas on the scorecard to measure and influence based on the great category assessment that we've um, that we've run uh, through then to so what does that mean and what are the categories and uh, strategies that we need to um, to leverage to unlock the category opportunities that we've identified um, and those could be making our categories more visible um, helping our shoppers navigate them better through our taxonomy helping to choose or develop um, within uh, Within the, within the category based on the market development stage um, and based on you know, the opportunities identified. 
through to our tactics um, and I thought Stane did a, a great job in terms of bringing to life some of those that we as category managers can continue to think about. Um, are we really unlocking all of those touch points, uh, reducing pain points for our shoppers and really adding value uh, for them that we can continue to, to delight um, and deliver against that triple win. I think Stane was absolutely right when it comes to implementation and category reviews then it's often quicker than in, in uh, our, our brick and mortar. So um, we need to make sure that we're set up for that um, and that we're able to um, be agile in how we test um, and then also how we deploy um, and how we review and bring those learnings through to be able to, to continue to deliver in an omni world. So that just gives you a flavor of what we're starting to think about in terms of how we can continue to raise the bar um, in category management, how we need to continue to evolve and, and stretch our thinking so that we can continue to delight um, our shoppers. So I'll hand over to Tara now, who's going to bring to life a little bit more about um, focusing on digital captaincies and sharing as well some of our key learnings. Good morning from the US, everyone. Um, like Audrey said, wanted to talk to you about a real life um, now relationship that we've built specifically with Target. They are actually our first um, retail customer that's gone into digital captaincy with us, but I will say that there's some small regional accounts such as Meyer that are official category captains. Um, we're walk working as we speak on Walmart as well as Chewy. Um, I will be joining a workshop right after this um, with Chewy that's in town uh, to work with us. So some major retailers then looking at captaincy, it's, it's new to them in terms of this digital and omni-channel space. So it is not necessarily a term that they're familiar with if there are teams that have been operating more in that space versus what we've seen in the physical world. So we really have to work with them to understand what are the benefits of having that captaincy together and working together um, to create the best experience for the shopper. So when we defined this with Target, um, to create not just the digital strategy, but really that omni strategy. Some of the things that we're looking at in areas um, within the experience that we break down are general digital experiences such as landing pages. So you're seeing some examples here um, that we've put into testing um, and help design that for them, knowing the category best. We work on taxonomy and filters, so just ease of shopping um, throughout that experience for the shopper work on category variation strategy, as well as just title guidelines. So anything that's on a product page, making sure that we're setting guidelines for the full category to follow, not just ourselves, but really bringing them that best practice. We work on assortment strategy. So when you think about a target as a specific example, they pull from their shelves in order to supply any online orders as well. They don't have a ton of distribution centers. They're using the store as one. So making sure that we're setting them up for success um, with making sure we have the right assortment as they're looking to then expand potentially into the distribution center space. Um, working on boosting strategy. So how do we get key products to stand out? Um, overall guest experience. So they call their customers guests, um, making sure that we're making that the best for those. We do digital store walks, which is really a process um, that we work on for them and all retailers in general of walking through their platforms to call out opportunities that we see based on research that we do, as well as general thought leadership. So really more thinking more strategically for them and longer term, which in e-com is a little bit shorter than what we're used to as well. Um, you're not able to go, you know, multiple years out in some cases, it might be a six to, you know, one year strategy, for example, um, and then tons of reporting and competitive insights come with that as well. Um, so that's really the benefit of working together. And wanted to share the shopper based design process or what we call for the digital space ESBD. Um, you know, not a new industry term. A lot of you have probably heard about this or used a similar process yourself, but we do highlight this with our retailers to help them understand what we want that process to look like together again. Um, so pet parents as they navigate the category and how we help them through that. So it really starts with a hypothesis a discovery phase at the beginning. Then it moves into developing a strategy. How are we going to approach the research in order to act on our hypotheses and really orchestrate the shopper behavior? So how do we want them to behave? How do we improve that for them? 
so that they're not telling us and dictating to us, but really we're making that best in class for them. We deploy, deploy the solution through our research, and then ideally we bring the research to the retailer, um, really convince them of why through results that we have. Um, so KPIs, how did that work for us? Show them um, design ideas, things like that, the principles behind it. And then we try to influence the retailers with the hopes that they then test live on their site. So it should really be this full process to make sure that it's validated throughout. And then it's a continuous improvement process as well. So it doesn't just stop with one idea, it's continuously evolving as you know their website, mobile apps, et cetera, change. Um, but really the objective of the full process is so that we can orchestrate new behavior with shoppers at the key points of conversion to really drive that incremental growth um, for our retail partners as well as ourselves. So help them notice more products, help them purchase potentially more premium products, which is really hard in today's um, conversation. We're talking about how do we help shoppers, whether they're spending more or potentially less money and getting them to maybe buy additional categories versus maybe a more premium product with you know dry dog food for instance and then expanding the consideration set for them as well and as audrey mentioned we definitely have a full process and suite of tools and methodologies that we pull from to talk the full shopper experience so in the Nashville market, which is where our headquarters is based, we have physical testing space in which we call Slick, um, which opened in 2015 for research. So it's really traditional shelving type research that we can do in a number of different environments we have physically built in that space. Then in 2018, when um, I came in a role specifically in the digital space, we developed what we call eSlick. So it's all digital capabilities for testing. Um, the you know processes that I had just talked about. And then in 2020, we built um, pickup solutions as well to do with testing. So we started with the curbside um, pickup solution and this past year, um, it was a little delayed just because of COVID, but this past year we were able to test in-store pickup as well and test everything from merchandising in those areas to digital tactics in those areas. So really cool stuff. And then wanted to end our presentation because this question comes to us a lot of how are we building the omni category leadership within our space so really the team started out with just the foundation so just digital knowledge in general it was a silo team developed on its own um, pure play focus for sure with amazon and chewy for instance um, and making sure we got the digital shelf fundamentals in place it then went into kind of that middle area with thinking more shopper journey. So how do we integrate the team a little bit more? We expanded customers even that we focused on. We're researching total shopper journey. So even pre and post actual retail shopping, how does that all come together for the shopper and influence them? Solutions um, that were category focused as well. Our retailers love that we're category focused. I think that's definitely something that makes us stand out against our competition. And then making sure that we, you know, expanded some of the programs that we had for measurement to think shopper based design, not not just digital shelf fundamentals. And then where we're at today is more organizational integration and especially in the US, we are a key market for our global business um, to make sure we get this right. So we even have a VP over digital um, that's come on board and she's been building out her team as well. Um, so we have specialists in this area, but we're also at the same time developing the rest of the category team because we really have the expectation that everybody is involved in this. It's not the specialists anymore in specific digital or omni roles. It's really everybody should be speaking this regardless of who they're interacting with on the customer side. Um, so it's our sales teams, it's our category teams, it's everybody that should be able to do data and analytics and really understand that shopper. Um, we have a ton of trainings that are now available within the organization, but really what's key for us is the partnerships we've now been able to develop with our key customers. Declan, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Audrey, Audrey and Tara, so much. Um, first of all, for for you know impressing upon us how 
grounded your approach is still within the eight step approach to category management and sharing with us your interpretation of digital captaincy, which is, you know, no surprise to hear that that's a journey um, that you're, you're discovering um, how that relationship with your customers and your retailers should be. Um, and in many cases, it's the retailer's first entry into digital captaincy, which undoubtedly is going to become a more common phrase within category management. I'm going to continue that journey towards category building um, by welcoming our team from um, Italy um, and welcoming particularly uh, Alessia and Francesco, who are going to talk about the journey towards category building from offline to online um, and look forward to Audrey and Tara joining us in, in about 15 minutes or so when we will, we will have a quick discussion on what we've learned today. Hello, Alessia, Francesco, Giulio, and Antonella. Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you see my screen? Everything okay? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, just, just waiting for Hello. the slide to go into presentation mode. Okay, so just give me a second. Here we go. We should be there, right? Great. Thanks, guys. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, we're really honored to be here today with this lineup of speakers, and we thank you very much, PCR, for giving out this exciting opportunity. Uh, our aim today is to drive you to, uh, to our journey, gradual journey towards category business building from offline to online. So, uh, please let me. Uh, let me introduce the team. Uh, my name is Alessia Vercesi, Head of Trade Marketing and Category Development at Red Bull Italy, with 20 years of experience in uh, um, beverage business. And uh, close to me, Francesco, um, he joined Red Bull in 2018 and he, he worked uh, uh, on the development of e-commerce uh, uh, from an international point of view. Now he is Category Development Manager, uh, Retail and E-commerce at Red Bull uh, Italy. Uh, so let me uh, go through quickly, very quickly um, through the agenda. Uh, we will start uh, um, from our journey, uh, from the beginning of our journey in category. Uh, then we will show uh, you our approach in shop red category and we will deep dive uh, uh, on online. Uh, finally, we will have a working case, so turning, uh, turning uh, um, theory into reality with get here case. Um, so the start of our story is uh, 1987. Uh, you probably know Red Bull as energy drink, so a very famous product but also a very famous brand. Uh, but Red Bull is not only, it not only created uh, this brand, but in 1987, uh, we also launched a new category. Uh, our owner at the time said that there was uh, no market for Red Bull yet, but we will create one. So uh, this was our progression, starting from 1 million cans in 1987 and reaching 9.8 billion uh, in the last uh, year. How uh, did we reach so? We started from a uh, uh, product trial. So here you can see our first mini car, very iconic, uh, where we, uh, when we created uh, through this, uh, the, um, the word of mouth and the trial, the product trial. So this was one of our marketing assets and the core of our marketing strategy. Uh, then we moved to the distribution and we started our distribution uh, first from out of home channel, then uh, we moved to retail and travel retail, and finally to e-commerce. For sure, we have uh, a great opportunity in, in e-commerce still, and uh, uh, e-commerce is uh, uh, one of our strategic focus. Um, we see here uh, our progression as Red Bull, but we, uh, we had a similar progression for the whole category. Uh, and we drove this progression as a category captain and category leaders. How uh, did we uh, achieve these results? Uh, using the classical category levers, so assortment, starting from one can and uh, 
uh, gaining uh, the, the, the total assortment uh, uh, on uh, on variants and multipacks. Then we we also worked uh, on uh, visibility on the shelf and space on the shelf, and also uh, we worked on uh, um, on multi multi placement and multi site in new store. So uh, we we worked on um, extra display and shield availability. This is one of our uh, important uh, piece of our strategy, the shield availability. Uh, and we moved, uh, we we used these levers um, starting from offline and then uh, adapting adapting and evolving uh, them also to online. Uh, our um, online commitment started in 2016, where we had a um, global workshop in Vienna. Uh, all the countries uh, uh, who were playing a, a role in, uh, in e-commerce, we made an assessment at, at the time and we uh, analyzed uh, our customers at the time. Uh, in, in the, uh, the fun fact is that uh, in Italy, for example, we have just four customers uh, playing uh, in commerce. Now there are more than 30. So you can see here the, uh, the development in just a very few years. Then we analyzed the shopper and we saw that, uh, um, that we had a strong opportunity across uh, um, generation, but especially on young generation. Then uh, we worked on assortment and we analyzed that 92% of assortment were made of multi-packs and this was a really uh, um, characteristic, a unique char characteristic of this channel because in the rest of um, in the, in the other channels of retail and travel retail, for sure, uh, our single can was the, the top selling SKU. And uh, we also developed uh, our first channel strategy. Uh, at the end of this workshop, we went back to our countries with uh, our first uh, e-commerce toolkit. It was full of category management principle, and uh, uh, really uh, it gave us a new approach uh, at, the, uh, at the channel. For sure, uh, one of our uh, category principle is this one. So the core of our, uh, of our category strategy across the different channel is Think Shopper as category. And this is uh, really key in uh, in all our uh, all our um, category uh, commitment. Uh, how can we think shopper? Um, thanks to um, a, a department that we have in our, in our headquarter, who is providing uh, uh, a universal truth on uh, shopper uh, and shopper insights. We have many shopper insights uh, uh, for online channel, like for example, that 10% of energy drinks shoppers for, uh, buy mostly online, and also that energy drinks are frequently cross purchased with, with Nexa. So uh, this uh, gives us um, insights to turn into action. But uh, recently, uh, we also, they, this uh, great uh, department that we have uh, in headquarters, they also provided us with some specific insights by country and sub-channel. So um, we also have some uh, specific insights on quick commerce. Uh, and so we discovered that quick commerce are uh, quite different from the global e-commerce or general e-commerce shoppers. They are young, they are keen to try new products and new variants and they are driven by impactful contents. And so uh, for this reason, we, we can define a, a specific plan on this uh, sub-channel. Another key element of our strategy, so the hero of our journey is uh, our e-commerce e e cross-functional team. We have uh, one e-commerce manager who is working uh, on, in category manage management and uh, who knows the principle of category management for e-commerce. We have an e-commerce camp who is working in sales and dealing with uh, negotiation and also uh, dealing with sales. And we have a marketing and advertising, advertising department uh, who are working together uh, and in sync for obtain, obtaining the best results and the best performance. Uh, the, the best performance. We also have uh, uh, collateral functions like insights, operation, and finance, um, who um, grant us to to uh, give this um, uh, to to give a, a long term view to our project and to uh, to keep it sustainable in the long term. 
Um, so here, uh, close to me, I have Francesco. Francesco is part uh, of the trade marketing team. Uh, he works both uh, in offline and online, and so he knows perfectly the, the environment, both of bricks and clicks and pure play. So Francesco, over to you for the next slides. Thanks, Alessia. So um, we want to jump into the two pillars that drive our uh, online business development. First of all, on the left side of the slide, you have the shopper journey funnel online, which really tells us the, the path through which a shopper goes through online, you know, starting from being aware of the product, generating interest towards it, purchasing it, and then become loyal to it. But on the right side of the slide, we have our perfect online store wheel, which is the framework uh, that drives our action and makes us understand which are the elements of the online shopping trip that we need to get right in order to make the shopper go through that funnel correctly. Focusing on the uh, perfect online store wheel, um, I really want to point out that this is a, an online category management tool that can be applied not only to energy drinks, not only to beverages, but really to any category online. And that's why it has been so useful to our retail partners so far. Um, as I said, um, it uh, outlines the key elements of the online shopper journey, uh, starting from the basics. So getting the right assortment online with a special focus on multi-packs. Then once the products are online, we need to make sure that they are displayed with uh, optimal content. So premium images, right uh, titles, and the correct descriptions in order to optimize conversions. Then we need to also make sure that products and categories uh, are easily searchable and findable, whether that's been done through the search bar or through the category tree. And once these basics are gotten right, then we can and should invest into additional visibilities, like, for example, banners. And that's the only way in which, um, first of all, we can create long-term growth. Otherwise, for example, banners are just uh, a short-term uplift. And this is also the best way in which investments in additional visibility um, can maximize ROIs. And now we are going into a practical application of what we've talked about in theory so far. And we'll do it with a practical case on Gettier um, in Italy. Before we jump into the, uh, the customer, we just want to put things a, a bit into perspective by um, showing you that among uh, the online ecosystem and among uh, um, uh, carbonated soft drink beverages, Red Bull in Italy is the second company for online revenues and uh, energy drinks uh, generate about 10% of online CSD revenues. So definitely both Red Bull and the energy drink category are very relevant in uh, um, online grocery in Italy. And to identify um, which kind of uh, customer is uh, get here, uh, we're going to do that by giving you an overview of what is the um, e-commerce e player ecosystem in Italy by putting the shopper at the center and understanding what kind of platform we're talking about, whether um, that's um, the, the shopping mission is a non-stocking one or an impulse one, and whether the total basket value is high or low. So um, at the top left corner, we have all those weekly and monthly stock up platforms, like for example, Carrefour Online. Then on the bottom left corner, we have all those regular replenishment platforms that definitely have a, a probably a higher frequency but lower baskets per, per trip. On the top right corner, we have all those special occasions platforms. For example, Wine Livery is an app that we have in Italy where you can buy uh, spirits, uh, snacks, and also beverages for your uh, special occasions. And on the bottom right corner, we have all those on-demand and quick replenishment platforms that are characterized uh, by an impulse shopping trip and a bit of lower basket uh, values. And here it's the, the, the arena in which Getier plays. Talking about Getier and Red Bull, um, how has our journey um, been characterized so far? So um, every journey starts with a beginning and definitely our beginning was not amazing. Uh, we only had a couple of products uh, um, showing up in the, in the app. 
uh, with not uh, optimized images, nor titles or uh, descriptions. And then if you search for Red Bull, all sorts of other products not related to our product or category were showing up. So that's why we decided, uh, we decided together with uh, Marco Bonari, who's the key account manager for uh, Getio, to start working on the basics at first. So uh, first of all, we enlarged our assortment uh, with a special focus on multi-pack availability. We created and populated in the right way a dedicated category for energy and sport drinks. And then we also worked on optimized content. So here you see uh, premium images, um, type and uh, um, clear titles and descriptions for all our SKUs. And once the basics were fixed, then we were ready to start investing into uh, tactical activations uh, um, that could maximize our sales potential. So first of all, we started doing sampling. Uh, we saw, thanks to our uh, data, that uh, uh, the shopper browsing through Quick commerce apps are very keen to discover new products, and that's why we invested into uh, banners to sample our products and make them um, aware of uh, or through at the uh, to the quick commerce shopper. And then we also started to do some tactical activities, like for example, making our um, hero can available cold because we knew that that was going to increase our chances of uh, maximizing sales. So that's really a full journey that has brought uh, amazing results so far. So keeping in mind that so far um, Getir is available in Italy in just five main cities. We have developed more than uh, uh, 32 cans uh, sold and um, almost an 80% value market share on the energy drink category. And compared to similar platforms that we have in Italy, uh, these results are above average, which uh, once again highlight the right path that we've been uh, following so far. In terms of next steps, um, definitely we want to keep on working on listing the full assortment, uh, maximizing the potential of multiplex, which are key SKUs on the online channel. And then, of course, you know, uh, there are lots of brands investing into um, online, but we want to maintain our category leadership and keep driving the development of uh, uh, the functional beverage category online. In terms of key takeouts, what we have learned so far in our journey, what can be useful uh, lessons for all of you. Definitely that uh, e-commerce cannot be uh, treated as a separate topic, but needs to be an integrated uh, part in the company strategy. We need to first start by understanding uh, what are the needs of the shoppers and uh, of the shop online shopper and which are the online shopper missions and how we can find ways to satisfy them in the right way. And then, starting from the shopper, we need to add categories. So we need to leverage not only what we have learned online, but also what we have learned in all these years in the offline world and translate them into uh, advices and uh, activities that we can do in collaborations with our retailers to keep on driving online growth. So thank you very much for listening. Hope it was a nice presentation and we are open to your questions. Thank you, Francesca and Alessia. Um, in, in Red Bull. Um, and great if everybody can join us on stage. Um, we've just gone five minutes over the air, uh, so I'm sure some listeners online may have to move on to other engagements, but I'm happy to, uh, to discuss or debate for five or ten minutes um, as we see fit. Um, and, you know, that, that was quite an intense hour um, in something which, is, as Mark showed, where we're in the fastest growing channel, which is in complete turmoil without any stability at all. It's, 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 it's fragmented, it's unstructured. We know it's growing. We're not too sure in which direction the tentacles are going to go. Um, we've, we've looked at the amount of time and investment in new structures within companies, both in terms of resources and in terms of uh, process design. Um, uh, Amazon have talked about their flywheel, uh, Mars has talked about their e-shopper based design, Red Bull has talked about their perfect online store wheel, all grounded in category management process. So it, it's some debate in terms of how do we get to grips with this growing channel, how do we have a streamlined, seamless method of collaboration between retailers, e-retailers, manufacturers and trading partners when it's going in such violent different directions all over the world. Brian, you have the answer, I'm sure. 
<laughs> I'm not sure about that. We've got some unbelievable horsepower on the line today. Hey, hey uh, firstly, guys, congratulations. I mean, absolutely amazing. The quality, the content, the learnings for the audience, just, just fabulous. So um, th th this was a great session. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much for putting in the time and effort to prepare your presentations and to share your experience with, with us. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, just real quick, because I, I, don't, I don't want to take away from you guys, uh, but you th think about some of the things that are really behind our thinking here. I mean, that just came out loud and clear, right? Firstly, omni-channel, the application of category management, omni-channel, is, is, it's a great fit. You know, you don't have to reinvent the business process to integrate omni-channel into, omni-channel category management into the category management that all of you have been doing for many, many years, right? We have to adapt it, of course. It's driven by different insights and so on. But the basic principles, the philosophy, the, 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 the steps that you have to think through to come up with an integrated omni-channel uh, brick and mortar solution, you know, it's what we've been doing, okay? We just adapt it and expand it and, and uh, and bring in that omni-channel perspective. Uh, so some of the, some of the, the key things, I mean, I, I just love when you guys talk about some of the things that Luke and I have really been pushing as fundamental to the to, to the category management going forward. Things like cross-category solution marketing. I mean, that whole concept of, of really thinking cross-category in an omni-channel world, that seems, I think you, you, all of you are saying, that that's even become, that's more important. Segmentation, critical. We have to be able to segment shopper behavior into different, either demographic or more importantly, different behavior, different, different, different behavior profiles. Shopper missions, the importance of understanding different shopper missions are driven by different motivations, which leads to different channel choices, which different, which leads to category and brand choices. Okay, uh, collab, uh, category vision. I'm sure Luke will talk about that. The critical nature for suppliers of driving that category dialogue through very clear category visions. That, that's where the value is for, you, for, for any supplier, to bring that vision into the category management process. Uh, and lastly, collaboration. You know, As you know, one of our big themes this year in, in Catman Network is to really push, promote, point out the value of of improved collaboration. And then lastly, organizational capabilities. I mean, you can't do it without really thinking about how the organization can deliver this kind of new message and new value. So again, guys, thanks so much. You reinforced a lot of the key principles that the Catman Network is really promoting to category and management professionals all around the world. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for your wonderfully sound and uh, impressive messages and uh, you know, we, we, we definitely appreciate the time and effort you put into uh, the into the session this morning. Mr. De Millionaire. Yes, Brian, you took all the words out of my mouth as usual. <laughs> well, you should never let me go first. I told you that. Yeah. Right. You never <laughs> let me go first. No, it, yeah, it was, it, it was really fabulous. And, uh, you know, to come back to your key question, Declan, uh, how do we start with all this? Um, and, and, and Brian gave some of the pieces already. He said, uh, you know, we have the process. Uh, but if you look, if you look to the consumer shopper journey, the first three steps, the segmentation, the shopping mission and the omni channel, you know, who, why and where they drive all the knowledge that we need to build in category management. And I think Mark has given an excellent presentation from GFK and, and it proves that, you know, when, when you make category plans in this new world, you need the market data across channels. This is really key what Mark brought us there and, and we need the help of people like him to see where are we going to play? Who are the segments that make 80% of our product business, right? What are their short emissions? And where do they shop and how, how is this evolving? How big it is? And, and this is driving the first three elements of the, of the journey. And then I like really, you know, what, uh, what Tara and, uh, you know, said, uh, you know, the, the integrated way of, of category management, the, the cross category 
and, and Stain mentioned that, that also the cross-category approach to find the demand spaces where people want to, 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 spine, to spend money, like uh, Jeff Bezos said, you know, we, we want to provide everybody, you know, for whatever they're looking for. Uh, I mean, these, these cross-function, these cross-category spaces are very different in a physical store versus the e-commerce. And so the, the ecosystem then that, that uh, Red Bull brought, brought forward. You know, great elements, but I think the tri the golden triangle is to build the knowledge about the who, the why, and the where. That's what you said. The category vision is the element from where you should build and optimize your business in this new world of omni-channel, opti-channel. And, and that, that would be my key message today. And I think we saw the market, we saw a retailer who was the best in this uh, at this moment, we, we see them in our studies winning everywhere where they come. Uh, and because they have such uh, uh, intelligence that is being built where, where the others are followers to a large extent. And then we saw some great uh, manufacturer work in there from where we can all learn. And I really love the charts, the learning charts, Audrey, that, that you pulled together uh, and, and also Alessa. So great, great work. Thank you very much. I think we can all learn from that. I hope a lot of people download these presentations and, and actually learn from it. And I think it's a great intro into the topics which we're considering for webinars three and four later on in the year. Um, and uh, within the steering group, we will have a discussion on September the 20th to consider new tools and technology advances to support category management. We saw so many of them today. Um, uh, used between Amazon, Mars, and Red Bull. And also, we, we're very clear on what we're seeing is new organizational capabilities and design for effective category management. And all three companies showed a, a quite extensive uh, journey that they've been on already um, in terms of restructuring and redesign of teams to deal particularly with omni-channel and make sure that they have a holistic approach. I'm going to just offer um, um, just around the table in terms of have, uh, do any of our presenters have any final comments or questions of each other that they wish to make before we wrap up? Stain, I think you're probably used to, uh, the, uh, just a question, we saw uh, Mars and Red Bull being quite advanced in their um, design and the organizational capabilities that they have within. Are they ahead of the curve in terms of the average supplier capability? Great question. You, you asked me a very tricky question here, Dick, and how, how could I say, how could I say no to that question? <laughs> of course, of course they are. No, I, I think on a serious note, I think it's, uh, it's always how do you, of course, uh, the, the, the intelligence which is available in most of the companies, because most companies know their consumers very well, how do you tra that translates into the customer understanding, and then how do you translate that on a consistent level to your retailer, I was in an occurrence, on a constant basis. And, and it's, that, it's that frequency of translation into the communication, also in the action plan, which probably does not happen on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. And, uh, Having to know the jump myself from supplier base to retailer base, uh, I think the theory is mostly out there. The question is then how do you put it into practice and how do you make sure that it's actually available across your total organization? Um, and, um, and that's of course where, 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 where the magic happens, but also what, what, what the fun is, I think, for our jobs on a daily basis. Um, so yes, yeah, so we, we, we always mention work from the customer backwards. Um, and that's probably what uh, what also Brian and Luke were mentioning. Uh, is if you work from the customer backwards, uh, you can't get it wrong. Uh, you can't get it wrong, and your category management uh, journey will be uh, uh, will be there for the lifetime. So, so no no short answer to your question, uh, as I want to uh, as I want to ditch it, but. Uh, Definitely, I think that's uh, that's what we would like like to see from every uh, from every brand. It's a well summed up stain. Um, and let's leave it there for today. Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, big thanks to all of our presenters for taking so much time to pre prepare the insights which they've delivered. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on September twentieth. 
we will have some steering group meetings in advance to prepare for that. Um, and I'm quite certain the two themes which we have are so relevant following today's presentation to look at tools and technology advances to support CM and new organizational capabilities and designs for effective category management. Thanks everyone for joining us today and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Bye. again, everybody. Bye. 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 Fantastic Bye. stuff. Thanks, God.